This place is called Thermopylae. That's not how they would say it in Greek. Thermopylae is the hot gates. And a long time ago, in fact, in 480 BC, this was a pass. The water came all the way up to near the foot of this hill. And then you have the mountains to the side in this area right here. So when you think of a pass, you often think of a cutting, but this is a pass that ran along the coast and went off to the south in that direction. The Persian army had invaded with Xerxes at its head. This is a biblical connection here. Of course, Xerxes was Esther's husband. Now remember that Xerxes had a huge harem of wives. Esther happened to be one of them, and God used Esther in some remarkable ways to save the entire population of the Jewish people. But Xerxes, nonetheless, was carrying on the legacy of those who came before him, including another biblical character who you know as Darius, who was also falling unto, uh, well, shall we say, the unfortunate uh, uh, position of running into the Greeks head on again, and he ended up having to back off. But a bridge was built across the Dardanelles, and it wasn't like the one that we came across, the world's longest uh, suspension bridge when we drove across that that had just opened up, but it was a bridge made out of a series of boats that were strung across this area that had enormously powerful winds and terrible, terrible currents going through there, and yet they managed to get a lot of the army across there. The Persian army was estimated to be by Herodotus a million men, by Simonides, three million men. By modern historians, they tend to play things down as being terribly exaggerated. They said that the Persian army was somewhere between maybe 80,000 to 300,000 men. Okay, 300,000 men. This is a lot of guys, and they're extremely well-trained. They're battle-hardened. This is the Persian army, and the Greeks know they're coming. And without going into all the many details, which I am not qualified to tell you all the different incidents and reasons why, that everything came to a pinpoint right here. The Spartans were among the best known fighters, perhaps the best fighters in the history of the world because of the way they were raised, the way that they were trained. Greece was broken up into a lot of different city-states, and the city-states didn't get along with each other. But as the old axiom goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they managed to gather together and try and hold off this invading army that was intent on conquering the world, headed up now by Xerxes, who was coming down from the north. This army, when it would come into an area like what you see out here, this, a lot of this was, again, water at the time, but the plains that where the rivers flow and the farms where they would absolutely defoliate entire farm regions, they would drain rivers with this huge, huge army. And now, here's a group of 7,000 men who are going to oppose this Let's just call it a million-man army because it's somewhere between 3 million and 80,000. We'll pick a million. That's good enough. And they're going to stop them, at least they intend to, right here at this pass. And of course, as Xerxes comes in, you have Leonidas. And he is the king of the Spartans. And he's got 300 of his men, but there are a total of about 7,000 men that are blocking this pass. Xerxes comes in and decides these people, they're nobody. And so he sends in 8,000 men to capture them. And immediately they find out they've run into Spartans and they are soundly defeated. So he sends in another 10,000 men against them and they are soundly defeated. Then he gets desperate and he sends in Another 10,000, including his immortals. Now, an immortal is a soldier who is not immortal, but they would fight hard. They would fight, they were the best fighters that they had, and they would fight just, just frantically against the enemy. And then another fresh soldier would so, soldier, sh, soldier, 
<laughs> would slip in behind and take over for the one who was fighting and relieve the other man. So it was a constant relief. So it was as if these guys never let up. They were always fresh. The Romans took this on as well. And it was the same sort of tactic when they would fight in battle about every 10 minutes, a new soldier would come up and relieve the tired one. And they were like the immortals. But here, here the Spartans once again kept holding them back. But then a traitor, and uh, as, as Pana, our guide, has said, a national traitor, and every country has a national traitor. This would be the Judas Iscariot, as it were, of Greece. Sold the pass through a shepherd's trail somewhere up over these mountains and around the backside. And the Persians had the opportunity to outflank the Spartans and the Thespians and all those others who were gathered fighting with them. And so King Leonidas dismissed everybody else and began to retreat from the Persian wall back. And they have a very clever way of retreating. They look like they're retreating. They suddenly turn around and they attack fresh. And you're not expecting it. Now, they had originally tried, the Persians, to wipe out all of these people with arrows. And they would fire, well, thousands of arrows from hundreds of yards away. And they realized that because of the shields that these people carried, which were wood covered with bronze on the outside, and they, they, they could absorb that attack quite well. And they were never brought down. There was an expression that actually made it into a couple of the movies where, what about all the arrows? They're going to kill us with the arrows. And somebody said, then we'll fight in the shade. The shade of the arrows that would come in. The Spartans were tough guys. But with the flanking maneuver of the Persians coming around the backside and the Persians hitting them head on, uh, Leonidas, 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 I can never say that properly. With a flanking maneuver, Leonidas finally dismissed the, seven, the rest of the, of the soldiers of the 7,000, leaving him with 300. And backing away, he protected them so that they could escape. And escape, most of them did, even though they took on huge casualties. And finally, the Spartans, under attack finally from the Persians, ended up on this hill where you're standing right now. This was the last stand. This was their Alamo, as we would say in America, where these guys held off the rest of the attack. And they had another expression. In, at least in English, their motto was either standing or fighting or dying. Their other motto was either come home with your shield or be carried on it. This was how tough they were and they thoroughly believed in the cause. Gathered here on this hill, finally, Xerxes managed to rain down on them so many arrows that they ended up, well, perishing in the shade of these arrows, and they died to the last man here. Now, the reason I wanted to be up here in the first place and be here is not only is this a spectacular piece of history, really one of the most renowned, if not the most renowned, last stand in the history of history that happened right here. But it also is not a biblical example, but an example of a biblical idea. And this is where, kind of if I could sort of move into a devotional kind of a mood here, that we all as Christians live in a world that is telling us for its various causes, its politics, uh, even some very militant things that ignore what God says, ignore his laws, they are not good for us, bow. And yet, when you read in Ephesians, and we were in Ephesus, that Paul told the Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I'm not going to equate what the Spartans did with the whole armor of God. That was Roman. These were Spartans. We know that. But the object of putting on the full armor of God there in the book of Ephesians was so that when you have done everything else, you'll stand. 
you'll stand. And no matter what the pressures of the world might be for us to violate, to turn on God's laws, to abandon them, to soften on those laws, on the things that God said, no, you stand for these things. He says, no, just stand. Well, that could get us killed. I have news for you. It got millions of Christians killed. When we went into those monasteries that we visited today in Meteora, you see in the rooms that you come into, these massive, just huge, beautiful, beautiful, iconic pictures of martyrs. And it's to remind the monks that were there, don't forget the price that was paid for you to be here today, but don't forget the price that maybe, God forbid, but it's possible you may have to pay as well. The Spartans died here to the last man, but they stood their ground. And they didn't know what the future was going to hold. We don't know what the future is going to hold. America is going through some very turbulent times right now, but it's just America. Countries come and they go. America will be one of those countries at some point in history. This happens to be just the way the world is. And yet through the midst of it, that we stand. Now this isn't the American stand your ground motto that we tend to want to hold on to, stand your ground. But this is simply we stand on the things of God and don't be moved from them, they're good. They don't go out and start wars, though they have. People have used it for such purposes, but it was never to be that way. It's not like Jesus at all. But standing is simply being like Jesus and allowing Him to make sure that by His Holy Spirit that we are molded by His hands, by the things that God does in our lives and brings into our lives, to be molded into the image of Christ. And then in the end, to stand as Jesus. The world will know that we're his disciples by our love for one another. But the world will also know that God sent Jesus by our love for one another. That's our stand. We stand in our love for one another. And you could fill in that blank with hundreds of different things where God just simply said, these are the good things of me. Stand in them, but don't be moved from them, please. Don't be moved from them. The Spartans didn't know the future. They just died here. And little did they know that just months from then, as Xerxes and his army would push through, they would end up at a place called Plataea, where there at the Battle of Plataea, they were soundly beaten, not by 300 Spartans, but by 5,000 of them. And you can imagine the damage that 300 could do to a million man army. What would 5,000 do to such an army? Plus another 30,000 other Greek troops in support. That's why going full circle back to our first day in Istanbul, we went to that bronze serpent column, which was made out of all the weapons and the armor that was lost by the Persians there at the Battle of Plataea. This, these men never saw, and they didn't know. And yet their stand resulted in that victory. And as Christians, our stand in the Lord results in things that we cannot even begin to imagine where God ends up doing marvelous things. This little placard over here in English translates into something very interesting. It says, transliterated, O stranger, tell the Lacedaemonians, those Spartans, that we lie here obedient to their words or obedient to their laws. That's what this says. They came here and they did what was required of them and they died here. And as Christians, we do the same in a very real sense, not looking to die, of course not, but it could happen. I find it fascinating that when the pilgrims were beginning to come over to the New World from Europe, they brought with them the Puritans, they brought with them two books. One very obviously was the Bible. But what was the other book that they brought? It was to remind them that when they go into this new land, this land that they didn't know quite what it was going to be like, it could be terrible, it could be hostile, it could be other things. Remember, just to remember where they came from and the cost.
to get them there. They brought with them Fox's Book of Martyrs so that they would never forget that no matter where they went, they still had to stand. And so that's why I really like this place. It has nothing to do with the Bible except for Xerxes being Esther's husband. But it has everything to do with something that when we look on this, we say, yeah, it was violent. We're not. But still, what happened, they were dedicated to the laws and the words of their land. And through that, the battle was won. Isn't that amazing? So here you are at Thermopylae. This place, an amazing place where one of the great battles of all time was fought and ended right on this hill, right where you're standing right now. Amen.